All right, so now we are ready for that big concept in calculus, the other half of the calculus learning that I've, that I've been talking about. Now we're looking at definite integrals, or that's the big beginning door of what, it, what integrals in general really means here. All right, so let's get to it. So uh, I'm going to need to erase the, the title of our discussion topic here to uh, put in a lot of details and explanation. And then, and then after that, we're going to really learn and, and to find out what it truly, mean, to, truly means to be a definite integral. OK? And so I need to just uh, maximize the, the, the more space I'm using. OK. So, but, so now, when, as we can, before we can get ready into fully understanding what a definite integral is, uh, let me wrap up a little bit and, and re, uh, recap a couple points or remind a couple of things back in our talks or back in our uh, the discussion topics about uh, a Riemann sum right there, okay? And so I brought up this picture that our function was an x square and it, has, it had this graph for us. And I only need uh, this portion of the graph. I don't need the complete graph. And so I used that interval from 0 to 1 as our main interval. And I brought up that question that we want to find this shaded area completely inside of this bent graph right here, OK? And so it's, it's always the best starting out example that in, in my teaching experience that I felt. And so I started out introducing through the, the, the idea of using Riemann sum. And at this point, uh, you got to be fluent that I, I, I also mentioned that Riemann sum is not necessarily an area. It's just a way, it's just a tool that we used to approximate an area. So at my start of this problem where I promoted, then I, I recommended to break that interval into four equal with the sub intervals. And so we built a left endpoint intervals or you know, right endpoint Riemann sum. Let's say, let's look at the left endpoint for now. So the first interval here, number one, according to the left endpoint, then we, we have nothing else but just that rectangle of zero height. Yeah. And then we're moving on to rectangle number two. Then our rectangle, see, left endpoint is here. And so when we evaluate into the picture, in, into the function, we have a height about like that. So the left endpoint decides the height of our sub-rectangle. And now we draw the rectangle over. Okay, so there is my rectangle number two. Okay, and so, and then on third interval, the left endpoint is here. And so I got that left endpoint is the point to decide the height for my third rectangle. And that's how I had this. And Again, you shouldn't be surprised about how I've got this, because I'm assuming that anyone viewing this video uh, the, has, has arrived here after viewing my earlier video lecture about uh, the Riemann sum. And so now the last interval here, I'm, I'm picking the left endpoint. And that's the idea. That was the idea that we used for the, in, in our earlier lecture. And here I'm just recapping it. And then same picture, same picture. Maybe let me leave that picture here and Head out on the other board, and same picture. Okay, and from the interval, same interval again, from zero to one. I stay with four subintervals again, but on each of the interval here, on each of the intervals here, I also show that we can, on the other choice, we can choose, we can choose as the right end point. So on first interval here, right end point is here, and that's decides our height. So we had a picture like this. Okay even though not too high, but it's a, it's a recognizable rectangle there. Okay? And then on the second interval, sub-interval, we chose uh, the right end point because see the, the, the rule here is the right Riemann sum. So this is R4, okay? and, and we had a, a, a rectangle like that. And this is just a way to envision or to visualize the, the work right there. And then that one here There's an interval where the height is decided by the right end point. Okay, so we have another interval. We have another rectangle. And then the last for the last or the fourth interval, specifically in this case right here, the right end point is here, decided by, I mean the, the, the height of that last interval is this high right here, decided by our right end point, which is also the last point of our interval. Okay, and it's right there. Okay. And so we were summing up. That's why it was called a Riemann sum. Okay, but now in the end, what I pointed out a couple of times already throughout our talks uh, in, in the Riemann sum, and maybe it's also best that I can bring it up in the picture here. So, 
So here's my here's that graph that uh, you were seeing on the board. So with this graph, the interval from zero to one is here. I put the two tick marks right there. The, this is the interval. Zero is here, one is there, and and uh, allow allow me to skip the, the numerical label. And now these are the partition points, just like that. How I drew on the board just earlier now with really good precision with decimals. And so left Riemann sum created these pictures for us. Okay, these little sub rectangles. And so the areas I discussed this uh, the back in uh, our talk about the Riemann sum that the area was the, the accumulation of these rectangle areas were a little under the actual area that we need due to these white spaces here. Okay, and now let me hide away the left Riemann sum. Uh, the, the picture created by the left Riemann sum and put on the picture that was created by the right Riemann sum. So just like what I drew on the board, these are our rectangle, but the, the height of the rectangle in, in each sub-interval here is determined by the, the is decided by the right endpoint substituted into the function. See, so the first rectangle here, it wasn't too high, but at least I can see that the height here is perfectly consistent with the, the right endpoint on the first interval plugged into our function being the red curve right here. And so that's how we have the uh, all of these rectangles are uh, created by uh, choosing the right end point. But in the end, the, 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 the trade-off for this is this approximate is still not good either because uh, it's, it's, an, an, it's quite an overestimate. It's an overestimate due to all these uh, excessive uh, amount of blue area above our curve right there. Okay? And so I also talked about back in the, our discussion about uh, back in our discussion about uh, Riemann sum that we can improve, there are ways, and, and the only way to improve is to improve the, the precision. Now let's get back to the left Riemann summary here. The only way to improve and to uh, shrink down all of these uh, white spaces here is to increase the number of rectangles. So I can increase that to 16 rectangles, for example. So pause the video if you have to, to quickly count. And so here I have 16 sub-rectangles. 16 sub-intervals that consequently produce 16 sub-rectangles. And so in that way, I already, uh, you can see that the, the total accumulated area of the rectangles here came to a lot closer than the actual area we're looking at. And then the, the amount of white spaces here together cumulatively has shrunk. Okay, But then I'm not happy with this. We still see a difference between the, 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 the approximate and the actual area. So I'm going to increase more. I'm going to now. I'm going to change to 40. I'm going to keep increasing, and then I also back at our talk about uh, the Riemann sums. And I, I was I started to put in in your the curiosity this question. Think about what happens when in the same interval, but you keep trying to fit more sub intervals in it. See, this is what I'm doing right here. Same interval from zero to one, but I'm trying to keep. I'm, I'm, I keep fitting more equal with uh, sub rectangles in it or sub intervals in it. So think about what's consequently happening to each of the intervals width here, okay? And uh, uh, hopefully you already had an answer as the, as this point at this point when you have arrived. But now I'm not, I'm still not happy with 40 uh, the sub intervals because uh, there are still these uh, visible white spaces here. That means we're still a little under the actual area. And so now I'm going to increase to how about uh, uh, to 150. And so now the area looks up the, the accumulation of the the accumulation of the uh, of all the rectangle areas looks so fine and, and it looks I mean through a, a I'm, I'm only standing about a, a two feet away from my computer screen and, and I literally cannot see the difference anymore. So so now the idea now is that the idea I'm I'm doing here in the picture here is equivalent to a fact that okay so now let me get back to the picture. On my board here, so we've learned through Riemann sum that we use or n. We use or n, and the setup is following. And here specifically, it, we started out with or four, and so we use or, I mean ln here actually on this board. Left endpoint a Riemann sum with four subintervals here, but generally we used a. Or n at some finite number of subintervals, and finite means it's a big word, but finite means something countable, okay? And so that was uh, the general Riemann sum that that I generalized at somewhere near the, the, the end of our lecture about the Riemann sums. We picked on any interval i, we picked the left endpoint, and then substitute that into the function value, then multiply with with the delta x, and then and then 
the reason I wrote and then I erased because I want you to follow the order. We gotta get all of these multiplications, all of these products nailed down, nailed down in each of your rectangle, and then we're gonna sum up all of the, the rectangle, all of the, of the all in that operation here, all the way from first rectangle, first interval to the last interval end right there. So that's what we did, and generally this gave us that gets uh, straight into the definition of our understanding of, understanding of what a a Riemann sum is, and specifically this is a left Riemann sum. But now, the picture I was showing on screen earlier that we, just stopping at 40 sub intervals, or n equals 40, did not give us a, a, a happy, a happily satisfying answer. Stopping at 100 was not happy enough. Stopping at 150 in the end, if we stop at any of the the finite count for the number of sub intervals, we're still gonna have a little bit. Maybe our eyes cannot see it, but the computers can still see it. So, the idea now, so the picture I was describing, that we keep letting, that we keep letting the amount of rectangles, uh, we keep having more and more rectangles in here, or we keep breaking our same intervals into more sub intervals. So we keep increasing the number of sub intervals here. I now start using a term increasing and increasing. I hope that brings up that, that brings up a, a concept that uh, you have learned throughout your uh, earlier calculus learning time. That's work you have seen as a demonstration on, on the computer screen is equivalent to this work, the following operation. From where our, well, currently the left Riemann sum, from where our current left Riemann sum is. Okay. And it's a sum for, for the, from the first rectangle or first sub-interval to the last sub-interval. But now the work we, I was demonstrating on the board there was, is equivalent logically to we want to keep increasing. So I'm taking the limits. I'm taking the limits. Allowing n to keep growing infinitely large. Uh, allowing n to keep getting more and more and more. Keep having more n and more n. Okay? So now let, let, me, let me write it down in, in a bigger space right here so you can have a real nice clear view of that. So it's a, starting out with a Riemann sum at a, with some finite n count for your n number of sub intervals. And this, in this board right here I'm using specifically the, the left Riemann sum with n sub intervals. But now unhappy with any particular finite count, we're gonna really need to achieve. So to achieve the best exact area inside of this curve here, we desire to apply the, the limit operation on that. Okay, we desire to apply the limit operation on that. And so on the right, on the, on the left Riemann sum, we can you see the work up, the work to achieve our best area, our best most precise area inside the curve here from that interval between zero to and one right there is truly taking the limits, letting n grow to infinity. Okay. So what about the right endpoint? What about your, the, for the right uh, endpoint Riemann sum right here? See, this was R4. So as a reminder, Rn was specifically on each sub-interval. I'm going to pick a point on each i interval, and I'm going to pick the right endpoint. And then the operation of the, the Riemann sum said, I, I need to substitute that right endpoint into the function and uh, multiply with the delta x. And then we're going to sum up all of the all of these products right here from the first rectangle or the first interval to the last interval. That's the general idea of, or that's the, the familiar definition of our right endpoint or right Riemann sum with generally at some finite n counts of the number of sub-intervals. But now, let me get on the picture. All right, so I apologize for taking a little bit of time to prepare a picture here. But so, back on that uh, blank, uh, starting from scratch picture right here, here's our interval from 0 to 1. And I already had that broken down into four equal width sub-intervals. And so now, with the right Riemann sum, this is what the picture looked like. And so we had, as I discussed earlier, we had uh, overestimates here because these are the excessive uh, amount of blue areas that stayed above our curve. But now, so if we are not, so now because we are not happy with this uh, overestimate right here, I am going to increase from four to a higher number. How about 16 sub-rectangles or 16 uh, sub-intervals? And you can pause the video to count here. And, and uh, uh, 
Desmos can produce such a beautiful looking graph for us for here. So the amount of overestimates has shrunk. But in the end, we still have a visible amount of uh, uh, overestimates here. And so I'm not happy with that. And so again, I am going to increase. So now I'm going to increase to about, how about uh, uh, 100. OK? And so now 100, then, then I'm, it's, it's starting. It, it has already become so much of a challenge to see. But I can still see a little bit of a, of a, a coarseness here, OK? Some, uh, that indicating we still have some overcount here. OK? And so now that means I'm still not happy with this, with 100 intervals. You know, sub intervals in between our interval from 0 to 1. And so that means there's still some overcount. So I'm going to, but you can see now that as we keep increasing our number of, uh, of sub intervals, then the, the area, the, the accumulation of the, of the, uh, the, of the Riemann sum keep getting better and getting closer to our actual area. And along the way, keep thinking about what's the consequence, what that consequence of uh, producing more sub intervals within a, a limited interval like this will bring for us, okay? Because you can see now that uh, what's happening to the width here, okay? Now I'm gonna change to about uh, 180 sub intervals. So now I'm standing only not even two feet away from my computer screen, and I can't even tell the difference between uh, the, the the area shaded in blue and the actual area, the the, the trap between the curve here and and the x-axis any longer. So that means that the idea now again is that we keep getting better answer, we keep getting better approximates of the real area as we increase, uh, as we are increasing the number of sub intervals or sub rectangles. And so that this demonstration here I'm doing on the computer screen is again equivalent to the fact that with our curtain um, Riemann sum defined for an, a, a finite uh, n count of sub intervals. Now to achieve, if we want to use, and remember I explained hopefully clearly enough that at the end of our talk about the Riemann sum, then Riemann sum is only a tool that we use uh, to approximate an area when we can, okay? But uh, it's, it's not always tied down, so a Riemann sum is, is one operation on its own right here. But in the end, this Riemann sum if we apply that to find the area here, then we can we can do the, this work right here on our curtain right endpoint Riemann sum with n sub intervals. But now, to, if we use this as a tool to approximate our area, then we can get the exact area by applying another additional operation on that, the limit operation that we allow n to grow to infinity. We want to fit more rectangles. We want to fit more sub intervals into the same space between 0 and 1. Okay? And so that's the idea. We take a limit. So we set up that, uh, we set up that, lim uh, that uh, Riemann sum for n intervals. And then we're going to take the limits allowing n to grow to infinity. Okay? And, so, and so now uh, that's just a, a, an illustration of the, of the concept right there through the, the example of finding area. So in the end, if we strictly stay with a Riemann sum, so now I'm going to clear away the, the area picture here. All right. And so just simply as a Riemann sum, just simply as a Riemann sum, how about left Riemann sum? left Riemann sum with n sub intervals. And we're summing all of that from, from the beginning, from the first interval to the last interval. Just as simply or as purely as a Riemann sum, we can always apply the, the limits operation on top of that by letting n grow to infinity. And then so similarly, and again, I'm saying that we are departing from the area problem. I already erased the area picture. But just as a Riemann sum, a right Riemann sum problem, summing up all of the, the products that you know function output at the right endpoint on each interval and multiply with delta x, okay, and then we're summing up all of those uh, products from first interval to the last interval. This is the right endpoint or or n right here. But now on top of that, we can always define an, a, a a more advanced version. So this is not only a Riemann sum; it's a Riemann sum with a limit on top of that. 
it's a three month term where we want the number the number of sub intervals here keep increasing and it keep increasing okay and so ultimately i came to that general definition of a general riemann sum so generally either right endpoint or left endpoint is simply just a point in any specific interval that we i chose that's why i call it it's a c point and so this c point represents it could be a right or it could be a left okay and so now so generally as a riemann sum that's how how it happens and we're summing up all the way from first interval to the last interval and so on this Riemann sum, this general Riemann sum, we can also apply the limit concept on top of that. This limit by letting n grow to infinity. Okay. And so, so now, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the, the following definition. So, let me one more time bring up the, the, the area picture. Okay, so for this function, specifically in our example that I brought up, x squared, we got this graph right here, okay, and from 0 to 1, but now we broke it down to so many x and the y axis, and we broke that down into so many, uh, so many uh, sub rectangles in there to the point that I don't want, I, I don't even want to draw the rectangles in here anymore. I just, I'm just talking about uh, the, the area that supposedly if we're shading inside of this area in between the, the curve and the x axis from between 0 and 1. And so, so now, if we are using generally the left endpoint rule, for example, okay, so this is the left endpoint uh, Riemann sum, and now we're letting the limits, the number of n, to grow to infinity. If we're doing that, now it's time to bring out that that impact I was, I started to put in your curiosity a little while ago already. Think. Now really bring out that understanding of yours right here. If we increase the number of n here to infinity, meaning same intervals, but I keep breaking it down to more and more and more and more sub-intervals, then each interval width, see if you agree with me now, each interval width has to get smaller, and get smaller, and get smaller. Look at my picture demonstration again. This here is the right end point. Let me quickly switch to the, the left end point here. Okay, left Riemann sum. We started out with, uh, okay, now you can see that through the demonstration here. Right now I stay with 10, and then if we increase to more, okay, same total intervals width, but if we, as, as we increase more sub intervals, as we desire more sub intervals, each interval width here from here to here is becoming narrower and narrower, okay? And so it's so narrow to the point that at Eventually, at a certain point, when our number of sub-intervals reach high enough, then we can't see the difference between left end and right end in, anymore. And so, here's the idea. And I, I started using that term accumulation a little while back already. And so, a Riemann sum is accumulation of, of, you see, a height with a width, a height with a width, right? And, each, and you, it's completely fine to think of that as a, a picture of the area. But now as we increasing the, the number of rectangles, then the width of each rectangle becomes so thin and so thin, so thin to the point that, see, if I'm saying that here's my rectangle, I'm not lying. Just a pencil stripe like this has a thickness already. That's dx, but getting infinitesimally small, okay? And then, see, because if the delta x is big, if we still have a, a rectangle like that, and that's big, but I'm talking about as we infinitely increase our number of n right here, then the rectangle gets so thin, so thin, to the point now that only one pencil stroke like that has its own width. And that width there, supposedly delta x. And then the height here is supposedly some, some hard to recognize left end point. Because you see, I stand right here with that. I can't see where the left end point and where the right end point on that pencil stroke is, but supposedly there's an infinite seemingly small difference between that. Okay? And so now, but think about it, we're accumulating that air that area of the stripe. The area of the stripe. Okay? And so there's another stripe next to it, making it making the area thicker. The area next to it making the area thicker. And the area next to it, accumulating it up, making it thicker. But each area here, the height of the stripe 
is being governed, being decided by where the function is at. And so, thus consequently, so when the, the, the stripe become that thin, each of your rectangle become that thin, then the delta x here will no longer, will no longer be, I mean, it, it comes to something else. It, we won't use that as a delta x, because so delta x is for something big. But now when it gets so small like this, where it's just like a one pencil stroke like this can be enough to represent how thin that is. So we call that delta x there, the delta x here become the dx here. Okay, see d is for difference, but now infinite similarly small difference. Instead of something like this, where it's still big, something we can still recognize. So delta x is something we can still recognize, but when we have that many, like an unlimited count, of, of number of subintervals, then d delta x becomes a dx. And when it gets to that many subintervals, then see left endpoint and right endpoint really come to just one. Just like when I'm demonstrating here on the pencil stripe right here, I can't really tell even though I, can, I can't really tell even though I stand right here at the board, left endpoint and right, right endpoint, it all becomes just one point x. And then the height of the stripe, the height of the stripe is the function at that x value. So now I'm looking at f of x times dx. Okay, so x here is just, it could be left end point, it could be right end point. Because it comes so close. And that's also the reason why when I first introduced about the, the Riemann sum, I said when it started out taking that route as a left end point rule or as a right end point rule is simply as a choice because now at ultimately at the level where you need to take the the limits letting n, the number of subintervals increase to infinity, then it all becomes just left endpoint or right endpoint get to one. Okay, and so, so now I'm see that represents the height. Or so, how about specifically for this particular example? Then you see the height is the x square. That's the function. So at any point, left endpoint or right endpoint, it all just come to an x value at, at that instance. Okay, that instance at the x. So left endpoint and right endpoint meet the same. The height is your function x squared. And then the dx and now is the, the infinitesimal version of that uh, delta x. And now we're summing up. I start using I st start using that term, started using that term a little while ago, but now I start emphasizing it a, a lot more. A, cumul a sum is accumulation. A sum is accumulation. So now ladies and gentlemen, I introduce for you, when we reach to infinitely many, if it happens, when we reach infinitely many sub-rectangles, sub-intervals inside a limited interval like this, the sum there becomes accumulation. So now it's this S-like symbol. It's accumulation. Okay, we sum up, we accumulate, we're accumulating up all the stripes. Each stripe, okay, each stripe has height x squared with a width infinitely, infinitesimally small dx right here. And all of those stripes we're summing up from, we're accumulating up from zero to one. This is now called, this is now called for this specific problem, it's called the, the definite, this is called the definite integral, the definite integral right, of the function f of x, specifically in this example, x squared, okay, over the interval from 0 to 1. See, 0 to 1 is the, we call this, this is the lower limit of the definite integral, integral and this is the, the uh, upper limit of the definite integral. It's just a little, little bit of a side talk here, but uh, anyone deserves to understand this. Even in our daily language that we use, the English that we use, what does the word integrate mean? What does the word integrate mean? Think about that for a moment, okay? Doesn't integrate mean uh, we're bringing things together? Accumulating things, that's what it is. That's what we call it. it's an integral. It's an integral. We're accumulating, we're putting all of these, uh, we integrate all of these little stripes together from one stripe, but we integrate infinitely many stripes to get what we want to achieve, the area, the total accumulated area inside of that. And so now we don't need a special formula. That's what we do, okay? And so, so now, same way. See, I started, I, I used the left endpoint on this, but even with the right endpoint as a Riemann sum, okay, for right endpoint on any subintervals, uh, right endpoint with the delta x, and then we are now letting the number of subintervals increase to infinity. 
that again will become just one picture. So that's why I don't need to draw, there's, there's no way to draw another picture like this to represent an infinite number of sub intervals for, for that where we pick the right end point. So it's the same picture because right end point and left end point as we increase to infinite, uh, to having infinitely many sub intervals here, then left end point and right end point on any interval. See, a stripe like this, there's already an interval. It's just our eyes cannot see it. So an interval like that, left end point and right end point comes together. And so when we, we take to that or when we're doing this route, it's all going to bring it down to this version. The delta x becomes a dx, the infinitely, the infinitely small d, dx. And then the left end point or right end point evaluated into the function now becomes a, the x squared. Because at any instance, we have a height. Doesn't matter left end point or right end point anymore. It's a height. And the height here is, is decided by the function setting, the definition of our function. And then we're accumulating. We're accumulating. It's all about accumulation. So we're accumulating all of those stripes from our beginning point of the interval to the ending point. So that's why it's a definite integral. So this right end point, I mean right end, right Riemann sum or the left Riemann sum, as we let the, the limits of n goes to infinity, it all, both of these becomes the definite integral. And in this specific case here, the function is x squared. So the definite integral on, on x squared, right, that of the function x squared over the interval from 0 to, to 1. Okay, so now, in that way, let me get back to my other board and now we are ready for a general definition of what a definite integral is. All right, so now, ladies and gentlemen, as a definition, as a definition, and I have to write it down carefully this time, it's a definition for definite integrals. So. The symbols is called a definite integral, okay? From A to B, that's how we say it, the definite integral of a function f of x in respect to x from A to B. Yeah, so definite integral of f of x equals, uh, as a definition, it's really equal to the, any of the general Riemann sum. A Riemann sum, how about, uh, the Riemann sum taking generally any chosen point in a specific given interval, multiply with a width dx, and then of course summing up, accumulating up all the way from first rectangle to first sub interval to the last sub interval. But on top of that, we take that as a limit. We take that sum as a limit, letting n grow to infinity. This is the ultimate definition of, a, of an integral, definite integral from, from A to B. And so now, and of course, this is provided that f of x is uh, defined. It has values and uh, continuous right, on the interval from A to B. Okay, and so in that way, that's the definition to put in a box. That's what it means, that's what it, that's what it is. Okay. But now, just the way we call it, the way we say it, this whole package as a symbol over here says, uh, and so you can see that the dx here this time does really mean the times, it's a product. We got stripes multiplied with infinite, similarly small, the thickness. And I start using that term thickness because that's what it is. Now it's just instead of talking about a, a wide, big, the recognizable, the, the width right here, now it's when it becomes so thin, it's just the thickness of a stripe right there, okay? But in the end, this is called, the whole package here is called, the, this is the definite integral, okay? The definite integral of the function f of x, okay? over the interval from A to B. So A is the start of the interval, we always put it at the bottom. Okay? We always put it at the bottom of our integral sign like that. And then the, the ending of our interval, the ending of our accumulation 
So that's sort of like we're accumulating from start at A and ending at B like right that. So the ending point is always at, uh, at uh, B like right that. Okay, so the ending point of the interval is always have to be on top. But this, this here is just a name, how we say it. But the true definition for any continuous function and, or, and, and defined on an interval from A to B, then the interval, I mean, the, the definite integral of that function in respect to x, right? Or just the, formally the way the definite integral of function f of x over that interval from A to B is simply just, it's the, lip, it's the Riemann sum generally. And then on top of that, we have to allow the, the number of n gets to infinity, okay? And so if, if any of you need to take notes, then I can just simply erase all of these extra writing because I wrote that down for careful purpose, but of course, any of our uh, functions that we're learning at start, they're all continuous functions, mostly. We, we won't learn to handle, we won't learn to handle the integral for this continuous function, not until like anyone has decided to go into a real formal math major course where we will learn a more advanced technique to find a definite integrals there for, for the, the, the kind of complicated function. But here mostly we assume our functions are continuous and, and be defined. And so in that way, this is your core definition in case you need to take notes, okay? And so that's why consequently, see, now I, I'm talking about just a chosen point. It could be the left end point, could be a right end point. And so consequently from this definition, now I'm gonna need to go back to my other board right there. Right now from that definition, then we can also understand that. So it's also true, once we had our definition of it, what a definite, inter definite integral is, then it's also true that now if we're taking specifically the left end point, the left Riemann sum, if we're approaching the left, using the left Riemann sum and apply on top of that limits as n go to infinity, okay, this is also landing exactly into the, the definite integral of our function f of x with the, the infinitesimal the thickness dx, right there. or just simply the, the, the definite integral of our function f of x over that interval of a to b. Of course, I'm still in the same you know, assumed interval with the, the general definition. And so, this, so it's also true as another truth here that the right endpoint or the right Riemann sum will also arrive, see this is the right Riemann sum and now applying the limits concept of that on top of that right, for i from 1 to n, the right endpoint, the right Riemann sum also arrive at the exact same definite integral, the integral, the definite integral of the function f of x over the interval from a to b. Right? And so now I also need to emphasize it. I, I mentioned this, but now I just want to emphasize the relationship or what connects between the f of x symbol and the dx here is indeed a real multiplication. So dx, now you can think of that as the, the, the infinite seemingly small thickness of a pencil stripe that, that you're drawing on your picture right there. All right, so I'm going to get back to my other board. So we just know that as a goal here, we want to do accumulation. A, an integral, a definite integral, or for short, an integral is accumulation. We're summing up all of the stripes. Each of the stripes has a height at the f of x, and then has a thickness dx right here, and we're summing it up, we're accumulating up. That's what the symbol is for, like an S shape, like, a, like an advanced S shape. And if we're summing up, we're accumulating up all the way from A to B. That's what it is. All right, and now I'm gonna erase the board and get ready for the next thing. All right, and so now upon realizing that uh, an, a definite integral is accumulation, and uh, furthermore we have gave, we, gave, we have uh, investigated that uh, detailed definition of what a definite integral is in terms of a Riemann sum, but taking limits, letting n approaching infinity, and n here is the, the number of sub-intervals uh, inside of your uh, given interval. 
And so in that way, from this point on, let's always constantly remind ourselves that uh, ourselves that uh, a, an integral, a definite integral, is a accumulation. It's accumulation of. Uh, it's accumulation. Say, you have a function, right? And from a to b. Okay. So we have a function, and from a to b, then at any instant x value. Then the function value there, we can imagine that as a stripe right here. And that stripe has a thickness. So at any instance, at any x value here in between the interval from a to b on this function f of x, then the and so we used to we we have been uh, visualizing the the function value. So this is f of x right here. So the function value has always been visualized as a height, and so a height multiplied with a thickness with a width the dx right here. Okay, and so that thickness uh, might space is getting a little tight so we allow me to write like that so the height in the way how we visual in a way how we visualize and multiply with the thickness dx so that's the we can imagine that as the area of one stripe and now we're going to be accumulating all of those stripes from the starting point to the ending point and that is uh, the 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 easy, i mean the best way to understand what a definite integral is okay and so now once we realize that nature, once we start uh, taking that nature of what a definite integral truly is, then we're now ready for, to push into our first example. Let's see, and we haven't done any formal technique to do calculation yet, but let's see how we can take that idea into a, our first example here. All right, so in example one, Let's look at, uh, well, and here we're going to stay with a quite simple uh, term right here, evaluate, OK? And now evaluate the following okay, integral. And so now there will be more allow me to, do, uh, to approach this example one as following. So the instruction is kind of hanging right here kind of got hung up a little bit, evaluate the, the following integral. And, and there are some more details, but allow me to mention that later. OK? So evaluate the following integral. And so in part A, let's start looking at the integral first, the definite integral. OK? So or how about for now to be preciser? OK? Evaluate the following indefinite, I mean definite integral. And then here's our definite integral over here. It's accumulation. It's a definite integral from 7 to 11. And our function, and our function is a 3x minus 15. OK, so this is function's height is at any, and whichever function that is. For this 3x minus 15 right here, viewers, or students of mine who are watching this video may already understand what this function is. But that's not the point right now yet. But at whatever function that is, once the x value, at any x value being substituted into this function, it creates a height of the function. And then we multiply that height with a thickness, dx. So that's the, the part where we can start visualizing. But again, I, I have to also mention and be clear, we, we visualize that as an area of a stripe. Right there, and then we're accumulating all these stripes. OK? And so. There isn't, right now, there isn't any particular uh, problem. I mean, there isn't any particular technique to learn up to this point about uh, how to calculate something like this yet. Because so far, I have only explained what a definite integral is. OK, so in this way, allow me to bring up the, the and I keep talking about visualizing the, the integral, the definite integral. So here's how I see it. 3x minus 5, for anyone viewing this video now, is simply a linear function with slope 3 and uh, y intercept fi negative 15. So I can imagine, and I don't even need to draw the precise graph right here, but uh, it's going to be a line like this. And I'm, I already let go of scaling right here. So all I know is that the negative 15 is a value down here, 
okay? And then this line has positive slope, so it's rising, okay? And then uh, we go in from 7. So 7 is a value because I know that this line here has to cross through the x-axis at 5 right here, and that's just some, you know, extra understanding. But so for sure that 7 is, you know, to the right of that uh, crossing point of the, your, of, of the graph and the x-axis. And then so from 7, we're going to have a, a height up to that point on the graph. And then we're accumulating all the stripes. So see, these are all the stripes. So imagine we have so many stripes to be accumulated. And then at each x, diff different x value, the stripes ha get more height and more height because that's the function, that's the way how it is. The function is rising, okay? And so now, when we're going to stop the accumulation, we're going to end the accumulation at uh, 11, okay? So right now, in a way how it is, the, in a way how I'm explaining this particular problem, I did not worry about, I did not want to approach that com in terms of any calculation at all. I just want viewers or students of mine to understand that we can approach a problem here completely in terms of an area because area is also a perfect place where we can visualize the work of taking a, an integral, of taking a definite integral, okay? And so that's the part right there that I would like to try to point out. We, we're just imagining or we're visualizing our work here as the work that we're accumulating those stripes running from, accumulating from seven and ending our accumulation at, uh, and we're ending out at, at X, when x reached to 11, and that's what this is, okay? And so now allow me to go back to the beginning description of our problem here, and, and indeed, here's what we're doing. I want to evaluate this integral, and I'm talking about the exact value, right? By interpreting as a, an area, okay? Because, so now, throughout all of my explanation, we started out as a, we started out as that motivation problem as a, as an area problem, and that's where it gave rise to all these techniques right here. And so now, without learning any special formula to calculate an integral, we can always uh, interpret this, it's this integral, and that's what I just now did right here. We can interpret this integral as accumulation work to achieve an area as following. It's the area that's being shaded here from accumulated from 7 to 11. And that's the area. So now once we recognize that as an area, then here's how I see it. This area here between the x-axis and the line right here and being restricted between 7 and 11, okay? It's simply just a trapezoid. This area here, according to basic geometry, is a trapezoid. Okay, and so we can also imagine that the, our trapezoids, when we turn the orientation, it can stand up like this. So we got two parallel bases. That's the way how any trapezoid is. And so, and that's the height. This is the height, okay? And so now with the area of trapezoids, the longer base is called B2, the shorter base, the two parallel sides, those are the bases of a trapezoid. B1, base one, base two. So area of a trapezoid, which is exactly the case in this problem right here. So I, I see this integral work, this accumulation, as the work that produces the area of a trapezoid as following. And that's why now I'm, I'm firm, and I know that I'm going to get into the exact answer. This integral work will equal to the area of that trapezoid here. Okay? And so, just a reminder, trapezoid has area base 1, Time base times base, I mean base one plus base two. Okay. Multiply with the height, which is this height right here. And multiply with and divide by two. Okay, so base one plus base two times height and multiply it by two. I mean the uh, divide it by two or multiply by one half. Okay, and so as a precise picture, again, uh, let me bring up bring that up on the on the Desmos calculator to uh, Illustrate the idea right here. Okay, so here's my uh, blank graphing space. And let me adjust my screen a little bit. Okay. 
All right, so I'm just adjusting the scaling to make it suitable fitting into the window that we have right here. But our function is a 3x minus 5. All right, so here's the function. Right? And then I'm going to adjust. I'm going to adjust this even further. Right, so that's we can see the, the the scaling of the problem a little easier. All right. And so now this is the beginning point of our this is the our interval right here. Okay. All right, so there we go. This is our interval, right in between us. All right, and now with this interval, just like that, now I'm going to do the accumulation. So with the handle of my stripe right here, I'm going to, so this first starting stripe right on x equals 7 is already at a stripe. And now as I keep accumulating with all the stripes from 7, and so now that's what I'm doing right there. I'm accumulating all the stripes from 7 to 11. That's why I'm achieving I'm achieving a, a shaded area inside of a trapezoid. And so now my trapezoid is the blue area here being indicated. Okay, and so once again, the idea now is that we use an area to visualize uh, our work, our final answer, or the meaning of our final answer of a definite integral. And then eventually, once we're all fluent with that, we, we primarily use uh, a definite integral to, to, uh, to apply that into the work of finding area. Okay, and so now, in that way, so now once everybody is all clear and after seeing the picture, now I can start putting, so the formula has been written down, okay? So now in this picture, this, I can see that this is base two, and this is, uh, this short little distance right here is base uh, one, okay? Or in a slightly different scaling right here, right on my screen again, okay? So base one is here according to what I was drawing on the board earlier, and base two is here. Okay, so base one has height, and even with the calculator, it's still hard, a little bit hard. I mean, even with the computer screen, it's still hard to determine how high this uh, base is, this base one is, and how high this base two is. But we do have a way to precisely calculate those bases, because these bases, according to our picture, they are just the height of our function at x equals 7 and at x equals uh, 11. Okay, so quickly, we can... I can move to the other board and, and do a quick calculation. All right, so base 1 is simply just the function, or 3 times uh, 7 minus 15, the function value at uh, x equals 7. That's uh, the way how I was calling that base 1. Right there. And so in this way right here, we're looking at uh, 6. That's 3 times 7, 21 minus 15. Okay? And then there's B, B2, okay? and then being 3 times uh, 11, okay? and minus uh, 15. Okay, and so that gave me 18. All right, and so now these are the two bases that we have. The one of them is being 6, and the other one is being 18. All right, so now having the two bases, this height right here, this height right here is just the, the, the distance between the, the distance between 7 and 11 right here. Okay, or on the picture. And indeed, just now I realized that I I typed in the wrong formula for this line right here. So, so it's I need to correct that. So the line is supposed to be like that. Okay. So this is how the, the actual picture that if we were using a a uh, graphing device for that. So this is the line for 3x minus 15. But but once again, back into the question. Now we're trying to obtain on our graph right here the on our picture, the height of the trapezoid is right here, okay, which is the, the distance between 7 and 11. So we can do a li quick little math by subtracting 7 from 11, and we get 4. Or right here, the picture is easy enough that we can count the, the amount of spaces here. So it's 4 spaces over to the right-hand side, okay? And then with this corrected graph, we can see that, uh, you see, this is B1 right here, and it it's happens to be right about 6 right there, okay? Just consistent with our calculation earlier. And when x equals 11, our base 2 has height uh, about 18, which, which was uh, what we calculated earlier on, the, on my other board. 
Okay, and so now, once we have that, all that, at this point, I am going to apply the formula. Okay, so in that way, the area here is going to be a one half times a, so six plus 18, okay, and multiply with four. That's all that is for this. And so, now I don't think I even need to pull out any calculator for this four, four cancel quickly with, with that two giving me a, uh, giving me a two remain. So two multiply and six plus 18 is a 24. So our final answer here turns out to be a, a 48. Okay, and so, so this is the work that we do. And so in the end, our final conclusion now, allow me to erase this. Okay, this answer here, our final work, our work there has concluded that the integral, the accumulation from seven to 11, okay, on this function, three x minus 15, this definite integral came out numerically 48, and that was in precise value. And so now, welcome to the first kind of problem that we can calculate the area, I mean the value of a definite integral. We did not learn any formal technique at all, but we can still have a way to get around with that and, and got the exact numerical value by simply thinking of this integral or visualizing this integral as a an area, and that's how it is. So be aware about you know the instruction of this kind of problem. It will happen quite commonly in uh, throughout you know a lot of your assignments problems. Uh, Any time that you are taking a an integral calculus course, yeah, you are given an integral, and the problem is asking you to evaluate the integral by interpreting that integral as an area. Sometimes it might say evaluate the integral in terms of an area. That's a slightly different way of saying that. Okay. But now once everybody is getting the hang of that, of that and see where you know, this kind of problem is going, okay, is trying to deliver in this example, then allow me to stay with the same example. But now we're going to look into part uh, B, just to aim at giving anyone a little more experience to handle these uh, problems. So we got to learn how to do all the, uh, the fundamental work first before we get into the real good foundation later on. Okay, so so how about what I have now is accumulation. Accumulation from minus 7 to 7. Okay, and our function here is uh, about 49 minus x squared inside of the square root and uh, it's dx. Okay, and so with a problem like this, if you recognize that that function, it's it's a good idea. Uh, if, if that's good for you. Otherwise, we definitely need to turn our uh, you know, turn our attention over to a using a graphing calculator, or you know we have to start looking for help with a ca graphing calculator to generate a graph for us. Because again, in this way, of course, we know that we want to do the accumulation work. Whatever, I'm, and I'm not saying that my graph here is the correct one for this. Whatever graph this function turns out to be negative seven, or maybe I, I drew that a little inconsistent with the description, but negative seven is here, okay, and seven is here. It's, an, it's a nice uh, symmetric interval. But, uh, and I'm not even sure whether this graph is above the x-axis or below the x-axis, but the point now is that be anywhere from negative, from negative seven to seven, we are going to accumulate all the stripes, okay? Starting at negative seven and ending our accumulation at uh, x equals seven. Okay, an integral, or more specifically, a definite integral is uh, accumulation. Okay, and so, so now, and the problem here specifically wants us to because it, we at this point we were not provided we are not provided with any special technique yet, and that's why we, and we we don't know how how long we have to sit there to do accumulation because we didn't learn any formal technique to get the exact answer of accumulation, so we have to try to see this as an area, so, so that once we finish the accumulation, we're gonna achieve some kind of area, okay? And so, and so in that way, being able to see the graph for, a, for any function in, in these kind of problems is important, okay? So now I'm gonna turn over to our graphing calculator with desmos.com. All right, so now with the browser here on our computer screen. 
Okay, and I'm going to put it back into square zoom as standard. And then let's find out what's going to be happening. Okay, so the graph that we're looking at, the function that we're looking at has the graph as following. It's a square root of 49 minus uh, x squared. Okay, and so that's the graph for our function. Square root of 49 minus x squared. Okay, so now it's going to start clicking for many students of mine and viewers here that it's just a semi-circle where this graph here is a positive graph. Okay, okay? it's not a complete circle. It's only a semi-circle, but it gives us a, a good enough picture of that. And now, as far as the interval of accumulation, we are accumulating from minus 7 to 11. I mean minus 7 to positive 7. Okay, and so here's what the interval looked like. So the interval is right from here into there. Okay, so the two points that I put it on the graph from minus 7 to 7. And so now to see a little better, so now I'm going to start showing the accumulation. Okay, so let's start with x equals negative 7. So when x is equal to negative 7, then we're at height 0 right on the x axis. And then as I keep accumulating further to the right hand side, and you can see that the height at every x instance, at every instance, different x value is gaining different height right here. And then we already, so, so far this much little shaded area in blue right here has already been a, a accumulation of all those stripes up to that point. And then we keep accumulating further, and we keep accumulating further. And as I'm going further to the right hand side, the height of my stripe changes. It's getting higher, it's getting higher, and then at past some point it's going to shrink down, but in the end we're still accumulating. So our blue area got more accumulated and more accumulated and keep getting further. And to the end where we reach x equals 7, we hit to the complete area. And so now once again, that uh, this works right here, obviously as far as the picture, we can see that it's a semicircle. Okay. It's a semi-circle. And then uh, in the way how I saw that earlier in the picture, with this semi-circle, the origin of the, or the center of the circle is at uh, the origin on the graphing space right here. And uh, it has radius, apparently based on the picture, it has radius uh, 7. And I don't want to go too far back into the ultra basic of algebra to, to uh, point out why and how we know that. So that's for you to reveal your, your algebra to understand how a graph like that came out to be a semicircle and it has a, it has a center it has center at uh, at 0 0 and then it has radius okay equals 7 and that's what it is and so once we understand that the nature of the graph and you saw that uh, we have seen that demonstration of the accumulation from the left to the right from negative 7 to 7 on that graph right here then now to get the answer of this definite integral by interpreting that as an area, then here we can do the following. Recall for ourselves, the area of a circle is a pi or square. Pi or square. Okay? And our r here, our radius here is 7. Okay? But then, recall for even further, on the picture it did not show the complete circle. We only show a semi-circle above the x-axis. So in other words, it's only half. That's what semi is for. It's only half of the circle. So here, in this case, well, we need ex just exactly one half pi r squared. So now this area here, another style of, of writing your work. And even though, I mean, when it gets to this point right here, you have your own flexibility, flexibility of how you organize your steps like that. But so I see this problem here as uh, the area of a semi-circle. Okay, and so here I'm seeing this as one half. Okay, and we didn't have to do any proven work for that formula at all. One half times pi, and our radius here was seven. That's simple. So one half pi seven square. Like that. And so here it turns out, and I prefer writing out my final answer on the board here as a as a uh, in in exact expression. So it's going to be seven. I mean forty nine pi over two. And that is my final answer. But do watch out for that. Maybe assignments here and there that you're doing may require you to put this final answer in decimals with a certain rounding requirement. So do watch out for any of those cases. 
and and uh, and for anyone learning from the, this video lesson, you are a lot more mature than than than, than just being hung up with the, the final expression of your answer. So just be open to any form of final answer expression like that. Okay, but that is another problem where we want to see. You know, we we successfully found the answer to this, and we did not learn any formula. I mean, this formula here is just the formula for the calculating half circle. Okay, but other problem is a different. Pro uh, uh, the formula, but that any of these formulas I introduce is not the formula in general to calculate a definite integral. We have not gotten there yet, but see, this kind of problem, is the, the experience you have learned here is that we can try to work around. It's a work around so that we can achieve the exact integral value, definite integral value. Okay? And so, and now we are ready for another example. I just want to show uh, as many different ex problems as possible so that your viewers and students of mine can you know, keep getting a better experience in, in how to manipulate around with these problems. Completely bypass learning about the actual formula to handle a definite integral. So at this point, once again, I got to emphasize we have not learned any uh, formal formula to find uh, the exact value of a definite e integral. All we do is just we're thinking of that as accumulation, and then we imagine we're visualizing that accumulation to achieve a, a known area. Okay, so what about uh, our function as following? All right, so from my lecture note right here, I have a definite integral from 4 to 6, and the function here is absolute value of x minus 5 dx. Okay, so it's accumulation on this function. It's accumulation on that function. And uh, quickly, now, it's absolute value function. So anyone learning in this video lesson shouldn't be surprised about the shape of, a, of an absolute value function. So I can quickly, without turning back into my uh, computer screen right there, I can quickly predict that the graph is looking as following. It's a V shape. It's a famous uh, V shape. OK? It's a nice uh, 90 degree, even though I fail to make that perfect uh, 90 degree angle. It's just because I'm not uh, an artist, okay? But that V corner right there is right at five. That's what this is for, okay? And then so we want to accumulate from how about uh, from four to, f to six. So we have, so if the, once the accumulation is going, we have, that's the accumulation that we're doing like that. Okay, and you can see that I'm doing with all those vertical stripes to indicate that we are accumulating those stripes right, from, from x equals 4 and ending at that instance where we reach, where we reach x equals 6. Okay, so one more time, let's look at the computer screen right here to have a real precise uh, looking graph. All right, so on my computer here, on my computer screen with the graphing calculator desmos.com then what we have here is the absolute value function All right so here it is that's the absolute value function and it agrees just like how I was drawing that on the board even though what I did on the board was missing out a lot of details but mainly it was this structure over here we got a 90 degree corner right at uh, x equals 5 okay and so now our integral, our accumulation of the integral happens from 4 to 6. Okay, so now allow me to show the picture of the integral, of the interval. All right, so 4 is our start of the accumulation, and, uh, and then 6 is the ending of the accumulation right there. All right, and that's what it is. And let me. All right, so now. Here's how the accumulation action is going to take place. See, I'm going to start with a stripe right at x equals 4. And I'm going to start accumulating to the right hand side and accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. Okay, and I'm accumulating from the left to the right. And as we reach, and so at some point the accumulation hits down, it looks like the stripe at some point hits down to 0 right at x equals 5. But then the stripe hides, regain its height right there. And we keep accumulating more height. And and more height, and we keep accumulating more areas as we go closer, as we get closer to x equals uh, 6. Yeah. All right, so we end our accumulation right here when x equals 6. And so that's the, the area we would like to find, or 
that this area that we are seeing here is the visual illustration of the definite integral. And that definite integral we're looking at is uh, the following one, x minus 5 in absolute value being accumulated from 4 to 6. Okay, and so now once we have a clear picture, then again with that picture, thinking of that in terms of areas, or this time we might even have to break it up into more than one area. Okay, so we have one little triangle from 4 to 5, and then that triangle, there's another triangle that comes out from 5 to 6 right here. So we got two separate triangles. Okay, and so, but in the end, anywhere, how doesn't matter how far, but anywhere the blue shading reaches and ending there, that's where we have to find all the accumulation. And see, I start using that term accumulation. So that means uh, even if our picture is broken up into multiple pieces, like how you have seen earlier, then we're supposed to accumulate all of the little pieces of areas together just to get this exact answer of the of the definite integral we have currently on the board here. Okay, and so, so now in that way, I'm gonna do a, a quick uh, mix. I'm gonna leave the picture here by the bottom of my board right there, okay? And, or maybe it's a better idea that I'm using the other board right there. All right, and so with the picture that you're currently seeing with that picture, then here's how I see it. For the first rectangle, how about let's call that the left one. The left one, let's call it A1. Okay, so A1 is the area for the, the left triangle. Okay, and it's just my style of, of laying down or organizing the problems. You don't have to follow exactly, but you know, it's, it's the more we put in the details, the, the better it is for your viewers who view your work. For that, think about once you have to present your work. And then A2, is another area, but it's going to be to the, to the right triangle, okay? It's the right triangle. All right, so it's the right triangle. And so now once we had a, a clear definition of what each one of those is, then I can see that the any triangle, area of any triangle is a one half base times height. That's a reminder for a triangle because now we recognize our shapes here as a triangles. And so any triangle is one half base times height. Okay, and so we can quickly look back at the picture itself right here. Okay, and clearly for this A1 right here, the rectangle, I mean the triangle here is having base of one because the units, I had to put it in pretty, a, a pretty extreme zoom right there. Okay, and then let me put it in a clo even closer mode right there. But base is one and height is one. So one times one multiplied with one half, we can get the area of that left piece right here easily. Okay, and so in that way, that produced for us that for area A1, we're looking at uh, one half as part of the formula times one for the base, times one for the height, that gives us area one half, okay? And then area two. So now the picture is still there in the corner of our screen so far, okay? And so you can see that uh, this is our base, uh, and that is the height for our area number two right there, or rectangle on the right-hand side, okay? So in that way, we can quickly, we can easily see you can easily see that uh, this is also base one from five to six right here. We have another right triangle. We have another triangle on the right hand side and this is base one times height one as well. Okay, so in that way, back to my board, area two is also a one half times base being one times height being one as well. We have another area being one half. Okay, and so in the end, uh, our, back to my other problem. So it, it is now apparently that this area, this total accumulation, this definite integral equal to the, the accumulation of the two separate areas. So A1, right, plus A2, right, and that is, uh, so we can, if, if we had a picture here, then we can label that. A lot of time these problems, 
comes with a, a requirement asking you to draw, make the sketch of the area. And that's what I did here, even though I did not put that in, my, in part of my uh, uh, instruction of the example. But so A1 plus A2, and this on the left is A1, and that is A2 right there. So that gives me 1 half times uh, 1 times 1. So everything on the, the other board was just for planning, planning down the problem. And then another one half times one times one, and then so it's a one half plus another one half, and that equals one. Okay, that is uh, how big that area is. Okay, so that's uh, what it is for for the the entire example one right there, where we're gonna uh, we completely utilize our understanding of areas and interpret any definite integral as an area so that we can still find the exact value. So I'm talking about this integral turns out after we accumulating infinitely many stripes here, infinitely many stripes, but once we finish accumulating all the stripes here, we achieve an area that equals exactly one, okay? And that is uh, our example number one. Okay.